Hello all, this is the lecture on Meditation 3 of Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. So Meditation 3 is the last one that we'll be covering. Um, the final two have some interesting stuff, but it's not terribly important for our purposes here, and we'd rather get a diversity of topics rather than just read Descartes for a summer. So. Meditation 3 is significant insofar as Descartes has dug himself out of the skeptical pit, right? So in the first meditation, we recall that um, he employs the method of doubt and those three main arguments, the part of prudence, the dream argument, and the evil demon argument, to de deprive us of knowledge of just about anything we could hope to believe if we're interested uncertainty. So that's the goal, right? Certainty. So it's possible that the, our senses deceive us, so we shouldn't trust them because we might be deceived at any moment. And it's also possible that there's an evil demon. Um, and as a result, we can't even trust our reason or senses. So we're, we can't know for certain. And so in meditation two, Descartes says, well, but there are some things that we know. Even if I'm completely deceived about every particular fact, even the possibility of my deception entails that there is something to be deceived. There's a thinking subject. And so famously he says, I think, therefore I'm a thinking thing. Um, and beyond simply this point, he says that this fact is known prior to the fact um, that I have a body or any of those other sorts of things. And so the mind is known better, more distinctly, and separately from the body. The mind is distinct from the body, so that's the dualism point. And then he claims that we can know bodies more generally in the wax argument, and the way that we know them is, of course, by reason. So, it's, so the senses provide the raw data, but it's reason that allows us to know that objects have certain persistent properties that we can clearly and distinctly perceive. And these things are like extension and space, and that things are movable and flexible. So now we know about ourselves, we know about the nature of minds as opposed to bodies, and we can even know something about bodies. But of course, all of these things are known by reason, because Descartes is a rationalist, so reason is the prime means to come to know things. So in the third meditation, we're digging ourselves out of the skeptical hole a bit more, so he'll elaborate on the things that we can know, and in general, a little bit on the origin of ideas. So we have a whole bunch of ideas about things, and you might it's some wonder as to how we know which ones are legitimate and which ones aren't. Um, and so he kind of provides suggestions for how we're to know, and that's already noted here, but keep that in the back of your mind when you're considering this one. The title of Meditation 3 is Of God That He Exists. I don't know if that's the proper capitalization. Um, but so this will be one of the take home lessons that at the end of the day, not only can we know about ourselves, bodies, um, and that the mind is distinct from material things, but, we, but now in Meditation 3, we can have a reliable method of knowing. A whole about a whole range of ideas um, and whether they refer to real things in the world and the most significant of these things is going to be God so before we can get to that um, Descartes just reiterates some points that were already established hopefully this font is better um, I noticed on the previous video it's a little bit small it's still readable but it might pain you so I thought this might help so we know now that we are thinking things, or that Descartes is a thinking thing, and in addition to thinking, what's entailed in thinking is also perceiving. So we have this bundle of perceptions, and they might not necessarily all be accurate, um, but they're still occurring, and so that's just part of what's entailed in this thinking thing. And so the method by which we're to tell whether or not these bundle of perceptions, these just happenings, are reliable or not is whether or not they're clear and distinct. And clear and distinct ideas, as I sort of noted, are self-evident, um, 
truth, right? So it's things that we can know by reason alone. Uh, so we can know certain things about objects just in virtue of the fact that they're an object. And um, so something that's entailed in the very concept of an object is that it's extended in space, that, that it can move within space because it doesn't occupy all space, that it's something that persists through time. Um, these seem just like things that we can know without having to study a specific object to find them out. And more generally, this principle of clear and distinct ideas, if we can clearly and distinctly um, conceive of, some, of, a, of an idea that suggests that there's some reality to that idea, that it's, that it's a true idea, that it refers in the appropriate sort of way, and that's just the kind of axiom that Descartes holds to be true, um, and based on this principle, he tries to justify a whole series of other things. So we're going to have to come back and wonder about how um, it's legitimate for clear and distinct ideas to be doing so much work, right? But we'll get to that in due time. So he asks, why do my perception of bodies seem clear and distinct? So it seems like I, in a certain sense, I clearly um, distinctly perceive my desk. Each day it's there in the same place with the same colors. Um, but that isn't what's clear and distinct. What's clear and distinct is simply the fact that we have a mental representation. So in the, in the fact that there's a desk that I'm consistently perceiving, maybe all the facts about it, what it's made of, what color it is, I might be mistaken about all those things, but there's still at least a mental image that I have of a desk. And that's what's the consistent truth. So this is just kind of reiterating the point for meditation too, that knowing about any given object is a matter of the mental activity going on, the reason, the mental representation. So um, Descartes is a little less skeptical now. He is willing to acknowledge things like um, math. So self-knowledge is, is just I'm thinking, therefore I am sort of thought that we've already talked about. But also math is something that we know clearly and distinctly. Um, and then he also kind of notes in a, in a kind of dismissive tone that the grounds for doubt for believing in an evil demon are slight and metaphysical, he says, in a sort of pejorative way, that, oh, this isn't really a very good reason to doubt, so we'll just kind of disregard it. So he's kind of, um, at this point, he's kind of, kind of given up the game, and he's willing to come back down to earth a little bit more. But in so doing, it might not be consistent with his prior method, so we might be a little bit concerned. So, um, now we're wondering about how we can know about a whole array of specific objects, or, or ideas, I should say. Um, so here's a couple, like you have an idea of self-knowledge, of math, of God, of all these various other things. So how do we come to know all these various specific things? Um, so before we can go about trying to answer this question, we need to know what an idea is. So for him, it's just an image of a thing or an object of thought. And so he's not terribly clear on this because these seem like they might be different. So an image of a thing presupposes that there really is something in the world there. An object of thought doesn't presuppose that. So if it's an image of thing, if it's an image of a table, it seems like you're committed to the further claim that, well, there really is a table, and that's how there can be an image of a table. An object of thought, on the other hand, um, doesn't seem to presuppose that. It seems like you can have an object of thought that you just made up. I could make up a new mythical creature or something and just say, oh, it has, it flies with octopus tentacles and it has the mouth, it has the proboscis of a butterfly and, I don't know, it's a strange creature. But you get the idea. It doesn't have to be reflective of any specific thing in the world. Um, so that's made mostly what he covers in section five, but I'm not going to ask you any technical questions on this point because it's not entirely clear to me. You might be interested in writing an interpretive um, sort of critical engagement for your weekly writing on this issue 
because there's some question as to what exactly Descartes means by idea here. So if that interests you at all, um, feel free. So this is a point, moving on to six, that we've already mentioned. Ideas themselves can't be false. So I'm going to draw a pretty picture. So here you are in your own head. Uh, that's a person I just don't want to. And you have these thoughts, right? And you have the thought of a table. And this thought, or you can have a thought of anything you want. An hourglass table. And that thought is completely self-contained right there. Just as it is, there's nothing true or false about it. It's just like a picture. Like, think about what we, when we learned about statements, right? With a statement, it's, it's a claim with a truth value. A picture in and of itself doesn't have a truth value. It just is a picture, right? It's just a mental image or whatever just sitting there. It just is what it is. The only thing that can be true or false about it is if we somehow say this image is the same as or is sufficiently close to this image or something like that right that's when truth and falsity is possible but in and of itself ideas alone can't be true or false um, and clearly these are different because this one because the one in his head is an hourglass and this is much closer to a rectangle a wavy bacon table what it obviously is. So um, that's just the idea there. And that's one that shouldn't be too unfamiliar because we've already addressed it. So I added this little heading so that we know what we're doing here. Um, so now after saying that ideas themselves can't be false and what an idea is at all, he goes on to talk about where ideas come from. So, so he's asking, how do we get ideas? What significance can we draw from the fact that we have ideas? So the first and obvious thought is that some ideas seem to come from external sources, right? Um, and one of these cases is heat. So, you know, heat imposes itself upon us. I don't intentionally fabricate it. I'll find out that it's hot when I wasn't thinking about heat, when I didn't want it to be hot. You'll burn yourself and, you you know, you couldn't have possibly contrived that sensation. It seems like that sensation can only come about if the appropriate external conditions arise. Um, so that's the at least thought. He wants to reject this thought, but it's one suggestion that is offered to explain how we come to ideas. So... Um, Nine kind of analyzes this thought and says, is eight a good enough reason to believe in the external world? Um, and Descartes at this point just sort of identifies a natural impulse to think ideas are produced by objects. Um, and I guess all he's suggesting here is on a certain basic instinctual level, no one doubts that there are objects in the world, right? So all we have in our lives is in an interesting way, once again, to do this picture, but faster, right? Um, you only have mental representations of phenomena, right? Everything you've ever experienced only arose as a result of some interaction between your various sense organs and your brain. And a result of these things creates this sort of experience that we have. And that's... That, I mean, that's just basically a fact, but but what we always assume is that this fact, and this is a computer, I don't know why I'm drawing a computer in particular, but what we always assume to explain these experiences is that there's an external world, but that's just a natural leap we make, because there's nothing in experience itself that definitively proves that there's an external world. It just seems like the natural starting place, and only upon... Um, certain sort of philosophical reflection, do we even ever doubt that? But the important point here is that this sort of natural impulse is not a philosophically robust reason, right? It's not a rationally 
justifiable reason. We have lots of habits. We have lots of predispositions. Um, humans are predisposed to think all sorts of things about the world. Maybe, I don't know, like he talks about the, the case of the sun. You know, what we naturally, commonsensically thought the sun was, was this little thing in the sky. Um, but we, lo and behold, it's a massive, massive ball of gas, which is just a crazy thought. So, the point being that our natural impulse might not necessarily reflect the way the world actually is. So that's not a good justification. Um, so, for this reason, he kind of entertains the possibility that maybe I produce these ideas from within, that maybe I'm just fabricating all of my ideas of God, of bodies, of all these sorts of things. Um, and some justification for this thought, as I already kind of alluded to, is the thought that um, our idea of the sun is drastically different than what we now think the sun to be like. So it doesn't seem that just because we have this idea that it, it reflects anything in the world at all. Because, of course, our, our especially for Descartes, who lived you know, almost 400 years ago, his idea of the sun was probably just barely, he was, he was among the first people to really probably understand um, what's something that's now fairly commonsensical to us, right? The relationship of the various parts of the solar system in relation to the sun and, and just the centrality of the sun and the size of the sun. And so that kind of new thought probably was was eye-opening insofar. It was like, well, we had this preconception of how the world was, but that idea doesn't resemble the way things really are. So there's no justification in just relying on um, our predilections, our natural impulses. So, um, so only a blind impulse. I should say I shouldn't say justifies. Maybe he says justifies, but um, the conclusion here is that only a blind impulse motivates belief in an external object. So I don't want to say justify because justify implies that it's a legitimate inference to think. That there are external objects, um, but of course we don't mean to say that there's a legitimate inference going on. We mean to say that it's an illegitimate, and that it's just a, a habit, a certain tendency of the mind. You might couch this idea in terms of um, modern evolutionary talk and say, you know, we're the sorts of organisms that were selected to perceive the world in three dimensions, and if we did otherwise, we wouldn't exist. So it's just hardwired into the structure of our cognition, um, but it's not rationally justified. So we don't have good reason yet to think that there are objects outside of us on rational grounds, and our, our predilection alone isn't going to get us there. So how else might we come to think that there are external objects? Um, so this other means by which objects arise and this is the trademark argument that Blackburn talks about. Um, and the idea here is that ideas which represent substances contain more objective reality. So this is going to get a little bit complicated, and I may post the argument separately. But this trademark argument, so 13 is the beginning of the trademark argument. So when you go back through, and try to figure this stuff out, this is a place to focus on. Um, so I'll, I'll explain the parts, and then I'll try to explain the whole argument. Um, so first thing to be familiar with is the various terms that Descartes invokes, and this is just from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. It's an online resource that's um, written entirely by professional philosophers and peer-reviewed. It's a good source. Uh, the specific article was Descartes' theory of ideas. If you're interested, if you ever want to look up any other stuff for research purposes, it's a legitimate online source you can use in citation. Much better than Wikipedia, and we'll probably have more answers. Um, but this article says 
The formal reality of a thing is the reality that a thing possesses in virtue of its being an actual or an existent thing. So formal reality means it's there actu physically, actually. Objective reality is the reality a thing possesses in virtue of its being a representation of something. So objective reality, if we go back to that picture that I drew, this is a useful picture apparently. Um, yay for using OneNote, except for my drawings are getting worse. So if this representation is at all useful, I have my hourglass table here, and then I have the table. So in one case, this thing has formal reality. I could probably just switch over to formal reality. And the other one has objective reality. That's, um, yeah. And so that's that's the distinction. So this is a representation of a thing, and that's what makes it have objective reality. And this one is occupies the actual form, so it has formal reality. Um, I guess you're just going to have to remember these terms because I don't think they're too terribly intuitive, but it's an important distinction to keep in mind. So the point being underwritten here is that so so if we have an idea of a thing that idea of a thing has objective reality and the way that it has a the reason why it has geez the way that it has objective reality is because there's at least as much formal reality there's at least as much actual as mental so the, the fact that there's a mental thing at all can only be explained, according to Descartes, by the fact that there's an actual thing making it happen. So the way we have an idea of perfection, or the way that we have an idea of God, the fact that these things have objective reality, that we can have an idea of them, is because there's, a, there's an actual thing which has formal reality, which is the sort of bestower of the idea. We wouldn't have the idea unless there was a perfect thing or a godly thing that could allow us to have this idea. Um, so, and similarly, there's at least as much reality in an effect as in the cause. So in this case, the effect is our idea, right? So the effect is an idea that we have and the cause is the thing itself. Um, idea of God. And then the cause is God itself, for example. Um, and the reason why this, one of the arguments that um, Descartes provides for this thing is so uh, an idea have, must have at least as much reality in an effect as in the cause. So there must be at least as much reality in the idea of God as in God itself. Um, and if this weren't the case, then what would happen, what apparently is the result, according to Descartes, is that we could just get these ideas from nothing. That these ideas could just be spontaneously generated. And that seems crazy. So the other explanation, the better explanation, is that they come from something, and that something, namely is the thing itself. So Descartes considers some other alternative explanations for how we come to these sorts of ideas. Another explanation, possible explanation, is the idea that ideas arise from each other, that we put together various sorts of ideas. Um, and so you might be able to explain a unicorn by virtue of taking two things and putting them together and then ta-da you have a unicorn with a horn and it goes over there right I'm not gonna... and these things together are how we come to ideas 
but this only works some of the time because for one um, there would be an infinite regress right so not all ideas can be of this form that they're just put together from other ideas because at some point you're going to have to say well where did the first idea come and that allowed for all these other ideas to arise so there needs to be some sort of foundation some basic idea that comes from a source that isn't just other ideas and so basic ideas like God must come from some source that isn't just a combination of other ideas um, and I guess I just cited this one in full because it's a good passage and it says um, if the objective reality or perfection of any one of my ideas be such as clearly to convince me that this same reality exists in me neither formally nor imminently and if as follows from this I myself cannot be the cause of it it is a nece necessary consequence that I am not alone in the world but that there is beside myself some other being who exists as the cause of that idea so this is just a summation of the last um, few sections from about 13 through 15 so it isn't the case that ideas just come from a mixture of each other and they don't come from me personally um, they must come from some external force so they don't exist in me formally right they only exist in him objectively as an idea not as an actuality so because of this they must have exist in something formally outside of him and that suggests that there are other things like actual like an actual god that is the basis of this idea um, right and so and now he's just filling out the sort of syllogism we have all the we have all the foundation that we need um, but now he's just applying the idea that I've already kind of been building in. Um, he does a little bit later, so you're not clear what he's talking about, but all of that previous work is there so that we can make sense of the idea of God. So I do have this idea. It's of God. How did it come about? It must have come about because this idea has objective reality, so it must have more formal reality. That is, it must actually be out there. Um, and then... Descartes considers some other explanations for this, and this is a little bit redundant, so I kind of skip through some of them, but I'll briefly sum them up again. He's already said most of the stuff. He's just kind of reiterating. Um, so this is a similar idea that I've already mentioned, that the ideas arise by mingling, that they just somehow come together in some combination, and that's how we have an idea of God. But recall um, there's the regress problem, that some idea would have to be the bedrock idea and you might think that this problem is a little misconceived because you could say that I mean although it is legitimate that you think some ideas have to come from somewhere um, it's not ne this specific argument doesn't have any special bearing on why it, we must have got the idea of God from an external source. It seems like an idea that we could have um, just mingled from a series of other ideas of a very powerful thing and a very loving thing and a um, very whatever other sort of thing. And so there seems like there's little burden of proof to explain why this idea is not possible. And in fact, Descartes does try to give a little bit stronger reasons in what follows. So. Um, I'll try to wrap this up in the next few minutes because this one's getting longer. So um, he says that we don't have clear ideas, clear and distinct ideas of material things. So we don't know those things, I guess, is the lesson to be drawn from this. So, for example, is, the, is cold the absence of heat or heat the absence of cold? It doesn't seem like there's any distinct conceptual relationship between these parts. It's not self-evident which is which. Um, um, so as a result these ideas aren't so complicated that he couldn't just be fabricating them that is to say they're not necessarily real 
things in the world that have all the same actuality as God um, because they're confused and not so great. On the other hand, God is so great that um, I, as in Descartes, the meditator, could not be the author of that idea. Um, for one, right, so this thing that has this objective reality, it, it must have at least as much um, formal reality as objective reality. And if that's the case, then the create, then the formal, the actual thing must be greater than just the representation of the thing. So, as a result, you could, the actual thing, that is, the being must be greater than the idea. So, the being of the, fi the finite being couldn't invent an idea of a perfect thing which is greater than a finite being. I'm going to post a separate um, link trying to lay this out a little bit more clearly because I can, I can already imagine confused faces from here. This is a this is a difficult one. So skipping ahead because he's redundant at this point. Um, so another co possible consideration of how this idea comes, um, he's reconsidering the possibility that it's just a made up thing that we contrive ourselves. Is that um, I invented the idea of God. I am approaching perfection daily. My knowledge increases and whatnot. So maybe it was me after all, and but Descartes of course says no, um, because it's not just a matter of approaching a certain level or having a good amount of potential. It's a matter of actually at the moment being that great. So you know if you approaching infinity is never itself infinity, right? So I guess the same sort of thing could be said about perfection. If you're if you're improving consistently you're not perfect. And if you're not perfect, you can't create something that is perfect, is the thought. Yeah, so here he says that, same exact idea. Um, if I could contrive God, I'd have to be perfect. I'd have to have more formal reality than, than the idea of God has objective reality. That's a terrible sentence, but you get the gist of it. Um, and that's just in the stipulation that he already made, uh, and that's must be more formal reality than objective reality. And then, yeah, then there's a second one. that it keeps indenting like that, but um, this principle, an idea must have more formal, must have more formal reality than objective reality, um, so it must be more actual than it is a representation, so the real thing is going to be more perfect than the objective than the representation, than our idea of the thing. And that's the only way that an idea can come about. And not only that, but every effect, like every idea, um, must resemble its cause, that is, the formal reality, that is, the thing it's derived from. So the idea of per perfection must come from something greater, and it must resemble the thing which it comes from, so it must come from a more perfect thing than the idea of perfection, and that thing's God. Um, and then a, a distinct argument, and this one's not. This one's just for God, and it's not about ideas more generally. Um, it's just that a con conservation of a substance requires something greater than that of the substance, um, and so this explains the persistence through time. So how is it that this whole vast universe is able to keep on existing? The only way it's able to continue to persist as it does is because 
there's something allowing it to persist. Um, and I guess that's namely God. So we might say today, there's other explanations for that, but it does seem to be true that there has to be some sort of regulating principle for the universe to continue to exist as it does from moment to moment. Um, so the final thought is that, oh, maybe these ideas are just a result of my parents, and this is just kind of a feeble attempt, and it's and you're just like, no, um, parents aren't any more special than I am. They couldn't create such a powerful idea because they're not that special. Um, and then again, kind of redundant, this is once again the combination of ideas, um, explanation that Descartes rejects. But in this case, he provides a distinct objection. He says, um, it's not a combination of ideas, but this time, the reason why that can't be the case is because perfection entails unity and simplicity. And so if the idea of perfection or of God is the result of us combining really loving with a man, with really powerful, with various other things, that conglomeration of ideas is less simple and perfect than um, than I, the idea of God just springing of its own right or springing from God directly. So the more perfect explanation is preferable, I guess. Um, right. So the main problem here, and this is this is a famous objection that you can probably find all, all sorts of places. It's called the Cartesian Circle. Um, and this is an objection to what Descartes attempts to do in the third meditation. So the idea here is that clear and distinct ideas lead us to God, right? So in section two, um, that's just something that Descartes says, that clear and distinct ideas are reliable methods for truth, um, and but then the question is, how do we know that clear and distinct ideas are themselves reliable? Um, at some later point, Descartes says uh, that God, because of God's perfection, God would not be a deceiver because deception is an imperfection. So therefore, we can trust our clear and distinct ideas. So the issue here is that this is somewhat circular insofar as what justifies our belief in God is our ability to have clear and distinct ideas, and what justifies our belief in clear and distinct ideas as reliable mechanisms for truth is the fact that God wouldn't deceive us. And the only way we know about God is because we think we can use clear and distinct ideas. So um, Blackburn formalizes this a little bit, and I have no why, no idea why it did that weird formatting thing when I transferred this over, but what I wanted to do is this symbol, so it's just like an if-then, so this is on page 38, and he explains it a little bit more, but I'll run through it, and maybe the conjunction of looking at this and reading it will be helpful. Um, so, if I have a proposition that I perceive clearly and distinctly, so P is just a proposition, a statement um, that I perceive clearly and distinctly, then that thing is true. So I clearly and distinctly perceive God. So since I clearly and distinctly perceive God, then it's true that there is a God. Um, so then I guess the final part would be that, if you want to fill out. And then on the other hand, the other half of the argument is that the way that we know that clear and distinct ideas are reliable is because there is a God. And because there is a God, right. So these two things, so here we use clear and distinct ideas as, as the foundational assumption in the conditional to justify our belief in a thing, God. And here, we use God as the foundational antecedent part of the conditional to justify our belief in clear and distinct ideas. 
So some people um, take umbrage with the fact that this circle is so simplified. So sometimes the picture is part of the handwriting, especially since this is getting long. So clear and distinct ideas, God, and then God, clear and distinct ideas. Um, but what might be important to add if you want to make this picture a little bit more sophisticated is these two other principles that I noted up here. Um, so it seems like as a result of let's see, wizardry. See, one note's pretty effective. Um, we can know. So clear and distinct ideas lead us to the sort of assumptions that an idea must have at least as much formal reality as it has objective reality, and every effect resembles its cause. So these are two assumptions that Descartes uses to lead us to the conclusion that there is a God. But how do we know these two assumptions are true? Well, we don't at the end of the day. They seem false now that we know more about the way the world operates. And I talk elsewhere about why we might think these are wrong. Um, but, so, you might think that the circle has three parts or four parts. First, we have clear and distinct ideas, which lead us to these principles. So, one, that's a one. And then two. And then these principles are premises in the argument for God. But at the end of the day, how do we know clear and distinct ideas are reliable? It's because God isn't a deceiver. Um, so that's the problem. If you can come up with a solution to it, you're well on your way to being a professional philosopher. So, sorry for the length. This is complicated stuff, and it's the last one of the week, so I wanted to make everything clear. Um, okay, thanks.